The Tom Woods Show, episode 528. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the show. I am preparing this on Friday, November 6th, 2015, in the morning, in the late morning. So I'm getting the episode out a little on the later side today. But, you know, things do come up. We had a couple of sick kids this week, so I'm slightly behind. But you'll get the episode today. And, you know, the episode always appears one way or another. So it is indeed coming out. But another way I'm going to kind of screw around here is I think I'm going to cover just a couple of the issues that I said that I would cover because I think I've decided I'm going to apply this rule starting today. I don't want to talk about Scandinavia anymore. It's got to be at least six months. Six months have to go by before we talk about Scandinavia again. We've covered Sweden, Denmark, and Norway on this show, and we've covered Denmark over on Contra Krugman. I think that's about it. That's about all I want to say on that subject for a while. But I do have a couple things I want to talk about today that I think you'll find interesting. And one of them comes from Thomas Sowell's new book. And it's called Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, an International Perspective. And it's outstanding, as always, from Thomas Sowell. There's so much great material in here. And I'm going to share with you really just one sliver of it. And I bet you're going to want want to go out and grab a copy. Of course, needless to say... Where do you expect to see this book linked? Why, at tomwoods.com slash 528, of course. So I'm going to do that. I want to talk about what he has to say in here about inequality. But before I do that, let me just give you an overview of what the whole book is about. On the Amazon page, it says in the description of the book, we cannot properly understand inequality if we focus exclusively on the distribution of wealth and ignore wealth production factors such as geography, demography, and culture. And he says that the true determinant of income inequality is the production of wealth. And he goes on, he's got, he's got chapters on culture and politics and social factors and so on, geographical factors that explain the divergence in achievement among different peoples. But what I want to focus on is just a sliver of his argument, which involves how to assess different uh, sheafs of statistics involving income inequality, because we hear a lot about this. And when I read Sowell's take on it, I thought, okay, this is probably the best presentation of this I've seen. We've covered this subject on and off on the show, but I thought this material was good enough to merit almost its own uh, episode. Now, I am still trying to get Sowell on the show. Uh, He is notoriously difficult to get. They did send me a copy of the book, so that's something. I think I got past, you know, stage one in the process. So I'm doing my best, but as I say, he's not so easy to get. All right, so let's start with this. When you're talking about how much income people in particular groups are earning, let's say people in the lowest fifth or the lowest two-fifths or the highest fifth or the highest one percent or whatever, when you're looking at those groups, you'll say, boy, those groups sure do diverge quite a bit. But what Sowell wants to say is, given that people aren't in the same group for their whole lives, a lot of the time people change groups, it would be better to follow individuals around over the years and observe their income so that we know what's actually happening in the lifespan of an individual, not in these different categories, because the categories might have different people in them. What difference does it make what the lowest 20% earns if people only stay there for two years or something? So what we want to know is, average Joe, this guy, this particular person, person X, over the course of his life, what does his income look like? That's obviously a much more significant, th- I mean, the other thing almost doesn't even matter. What happens to the average person over the course of his life? Where does his income go? I mean, obviously, when he's 20 years old, his income is very, very low. But what does that tell us about society to say, well, people who are who are low or pretty low. Okay, but he's not going to be that low for that long. So what does the, what does his life outcome look like in terms of income? I might add, by the way, before I forget, that you sometimes hear about the Pareto rule, the 80-20 rule, and this was discovered, or happened upon a little over 100 years ago, and it's been applied in many, many areas of life. The idea that 20% of your customers are going to generate 80% of your sales, or 
uh, you know, 20 percent of your website is going to bring in 80 percent of the results. Or, and this is what's relevant here, 20 percent of people will have 80 percent of the wealth. Not because they stole it from other people. You don't get rich by stealing from poor people, obviously. But this is just a fact of social life that has been observed all over the world and in all different situations. Well, if, if the 80-20 rule is correct, then there's nothing particularly surprising about that kind of income distribution. If, it, if it's observed everywhere to the point where it's basically a rule, then why would we expect, frankly, anything else? In fact, think of it this way. If 80% of the wealth is owned by 20% of the people, well, now let's look at those 20% of the people. And 80 and 20% and, uh, of that 20% will own 80% of that wealth, and so on. And so when you go and continue that process all the way up to the 1%, and you look at how much the 1% controls today, well, that's about what you would expect based on the Pareto distribution. Now, yes, I know there are people who get rich because of the Federal Reserve or because of crony capitalism. I understand that. doesn't matter because there would still be extremely rich people in the 1%, especially in a global economy where your marketplace is the entire world. The value of a CEO in those conditions is much, much higher. And the, the function of that CEO is far more significant because now you have to think about international distribution, international uh, client base, uh, international customers. I mean, it's it's uh, extremely important. Your uh, the potential wealth that you can bring in is multiplied potentially many times over as a result of these entirely benign conditions. Well, anyway, let's go back to Seoul. So Seoul is saying, let's follow these people around. I know that sounds creepy, like we're following them around with a clipboard their whole lives, but he just means let's track their income in a study and see where it goes. And he said, and this, this is what he found, or the, well, this is what one of the studies found. Uh, this is data from the IRS, and it looked at particular people who filed income tax returns over the course of a decade, from 1996 to 2005 inclusive. Well, people who had incomes in the bottom 20% saw their incomes rise by 91% over the next 10 years. So their incomes nearly doubled during that time. During that same time, people who were initially in the so-called 1%, the top 1%, actually saw their incomes fall by 26% during that same decade. Now, that's exactly the opposite of what we hear, and it's the opposite of what we hear from statistics that measure what's happening over time just to abstract categories, which are, as Sowell says, income brackets with changing mixes of people. And these are then discussed as if they were statistics about what's happening over time to a given set of flesh and blood human beings, which is something very different. Now, as it turns out, statistical surveys that follow particular people over the years are more expensive to conduct than surveys that just look at fixed groups, abstract categories, the bottom 20 percent, the bottom 40 percent, the top 1 percent, and so on. So are we surprised that the U.S. Bureau of the Census turns out far more data on what's happening to these abstract categories than on what's happening to particular individuals over time? But what happens in those abstract categories, Sowell says, over time, is discussed as if it's a discussion of what's happening to particular people over time, the rich and the poor. Sowell makes mention of uh, Thomas Piketty, whose book we have discussed several times on the show. And he says that in that book, we read that the top 10% of income earners is truly a world unto itself. And Sowell says, well, that kind of flies in the face of the fact that most American households, 56% to be exact, are in the top 10% at some point in their lives, usually once they've gotten older. And so as Sowell says, for most Americans to envy or resent the top 10% would be to envy or resent themselves. And he reminds us that age plays a significant factor, obviously, in wealth. Infants will have less wealth than their parents, who will have less wealth or income even, than their grandparents. 
Well, that's not the same thing as saying, as, as speaking about individuals as being in wealth or poverty over the course of their lives. Even the top 1%, which we hear so much about all the time, 12% of Americans at some point in their lives reach the top 1%. Paul Krugman refers to, quote, the charmed circle of the 1%, unquote, and Sowell says, well, it must have a somewhat fleeting charm because most of the people in that circle in 1996 were no longer there in 2005. There's also a lot of attention paid to the top 400 income earners and how, you know, how rich they are. And Sowell says that even more than most people in other income brackets, most of the people among the top 400 income recipients are transients. So in this case, mostly people with a spike in income for just one year out of nine. So whether their one year at this level is due to receiving an inheritance or otherwise cashing in assets accumulated over the previous years or is due to some other reason, the people who are fleeting residents in this income bracket are hardly credible candidates for the powerful and or sinister roles assigned to them in much ideological and political rhetoric. Then, too, there are cases of years and periods when a higher share of total income in the country goes to the top earning people. But this doesn't mean that because a, a higher share is going to them that people in the lowest bracket must therefore be getting poorer. If overall wealth is rising, then even if you're getting a slightly smaller share of the overall wealth, you can still be getting richer. So for example, from 1985 to 2001, the income share of the bottom 20% of American households fell from 4% to 3.5%. But the average real income of households in the bottom 20% rose by thousands of dollars. And as Sowell adds, this isn't even taking into account the well-documented well documented fact that most people initially in the bottom income quintile move up and out of that quintile over a span of years as long as that in this example. But even if they'd all stayed put, the rising amount and share of income of, quote, the rich would still not have made them poorer. Then it's also worth noting that so many of the innovations of free market capitalism have disproportionately benefited the ordinary person. This is what uh, Milton and Rose Friedman say in their book, Free to Choose. Industrial progress, mechanical improvement, all of the great wonders of the modern era have meant relatively little to the wealthy. The rich in ancient Greece would have benefited hardly at all from modern plumbing. Running servants replaced running water. Television and radio, the patricians of Rome could enjoy the leading musicians and actors in their home, could have the leading artists as domestic retainers, ready-to-wear clothing, supermarkets, all these and many other modern developments would have added little to their life. They would have welcomed the improvements in transportation and in medicine. But for the rest, the great achievements of Western capitalism have redounded primarily to the benefit of the ordinary person. Then, Sowell reminds us that Nathan Rothschild, back in 1836, was one of the richest men in the world, maybe the richest man in the world, and he died from an infection that defied the efforts of leading doctors summoned to his side. But today, even the poorest child in America is highly unlikely to die of this infection, thanks to the economic and medical advances we've had since then. Now, this didn't happen because governments got involved to stop people from getting as rich as Nathan Rothschild. But, as Sowell says, because people in some countries remained free to work out their own lives and make their own mutual accommodations on such terms as they could, with their fellow human beings, and it was largely from such countries that the technological and medical advances came. It's also worth noting, by the way, that it's been estimated that most Americans in the early 19th century lived out their entire lives and died within a 50-mile radius of where they were born. I mean, we live in a completely different world. The poorest people live in a completely different world thanks to the enormous creation of wealth, unprecedented in world history, that the market economy made possible. A couple more quick passages from Sowell, though, because I, I love the, the last one I'm going to share with you I really like. But he says, 
Even if every man, woman, and child had equal individual incomes, that would still leave substantial inequalities in household incomes because households that are in the top 20% of income recipients today contain millions more people than households in the bottom 20%. Such households would remain in higher income brackets if incomes were made equal among all individuals. If we restrict income equality to adults, there would be even more inequality between households, since households consisting of a single mother with multiple children would not have as much income per person as households consisting of two parents and their children, even if welfare paid the single mother as much as other adults received for working. But then finally, the last passage here. In these circumstances, even if every 20-year-old Puerto Rican in the United States had identical incomes with every 20-year-old Japanese American, and similar equality at every other age that would still leave a major income inequality between these two groups since the average Japanese American is more than 20 years older than the average Puerto Rican. In short, even extraordinary and unprecedented equalizations among individuals could still leave major statistical inequalities among groups. This raises a crucial question. What are the consequences of choosing and fervently proclaiming an unreachable goal? All right, I am just hitting the tip of the iceberg of Sowell's book. It's not primarily an analysis of income statistics in the U.S. That's, that's almost an afterthought for Sowell. It's an extraordinary book looking at an extraordinary range of countries and peoples and cultures and the vastly different results they've had across a variety of circumstances, it, it, it helps you to respond to the simplistic worldview of the left that expects all groups in all times and places to have equal incomes, and that if they don't, there must be something sinister at work. There's no way you could believe that. Uh, first of all, I think from common sense. But after reading this book, it is absolutely demolished. So very much worth looking at. But before I wrap up for today, let me do one more thing. I want to share uh, just a couple of thoughts from David Gordon about the episode I did. Uh, let's go back. I think it's episode number 519. Yes, tomwoods.com slash 519 is my episode in which I debated the subject of whether libertarians should support a basic income guarantee, a basic minimum income for everybody. And we talked about that. I talked about that with Matt Zwolinski of the University of San Diego. And by the end, I think I had forced him to make some fairly substantial concessions that his line of argument did mean that there would need to be international redistribution, that the American standard of living would have to drop substantially, and that perhaps some type of world government would be necessary to carry this out. Now, he hesitated to call this agency a government, but if you're going to try to get everybody in the world to cough up $10,000, I think you're going to need the coercive power of government to carry that out. So I talked to him about that, and I got a lot of feedback on that episode. And if you didn't listen to that whole episode, I really do want to urge you to go back and do so, because the really juicy stuff, I think, comes at the end, and I'm pretty happy with how it came out. But on the show notes page today, I'm going to link to a couple of resp several responses that I've gotten uh, to that. And one of them is from David Gordon who has been a guest on the show, over on the Mises blog. And he responds to the Georgist argument that Swolinski was making, which was that people don't create natural resources, so how can people claim absolute property rights to these resources? And Gordon's response is, I wonder why Zwolinski thinks that this question may be asked of individual claimants to property, but not to the people in a society taken collectively. And in other words, what he means is, society did not create natural resources either. Why then does society get to decide what the proper distribution of these resources ought to be? Pretty good answer. Then he continues, Zwolinski also appealed to the Lockean Proviso, a limit to property rights supported by Robert Nozick. As Nozick took the proviso, though, it would almost never act to limit property rights. It would come into effect only if people are made worse off by the existence of a system of property rights. 
In fact, of course, people are much better off because there are rights to private property, and Nozick suggests that only in catastrophes could one envision the proviso having any practical importance. How Zwolinski gets from the proviso thus taken to a basic income guarantee is not immediately apparent. And then the, the last paragraph, Zwolinski's best argument points to the fact that some people have acquired property unjustly. One cannot then rule out property taxes for a basic income guarantee as taking from people what is justly their own. Woods responded that one must deal with claims of injustice on an individual basis. There is no justification for a tax on all property on the grounds that unjust property titles exist somewhere. Zwolinski answered that Woods's approach permits a great deal of injustice to exist. I take it that he means by this the unjust property titles that have not yet been investigated and overturned. Zwolinski then would allow taking away someone's property through taxes without showing that his claim to the property was defective. This strikes me as antithetical to libertarianism, but listeners to this broadcast should judge for themselves. Then I want to share with you a comment from Dmitry Chernikov. I'm going to link to his blog as well. He's got a lengthy analysis of, of our discussion, but he concludes uh, this way. I'll just pick out bits and pieces. He says that he's quoting, he quotes Zwolinski as saying, we've obviously committed severe injustices against many of the world's peoples, both through our military imperialistic adventures. I believe we commit further injustices against them by means of suppressing their freedom of movement with immigration restrictions. And Chernikov says, this makes one wonder whether Zwolinski knows what he's talking about. Who are these we? Why does he conflate the people with the government? So, and he goes on to say, the employees of the U.S. federal government, such as soldiers, are part of an enterprise organization devoted to a common purpose, whereas the people living in the U.S. are part of a civil association, united only by adherence to a common system of law. None of us in this conversation here, therefore, personally committed any injustices against any person or people. As a result, since we know that we are innocent, we can be immediately excluded from financing any compensation scheme that is based, as Walensky's scheme is, on minimization of overall injustice. Well, I'm going to link to three links of analysis of our conversation at tomwoods.com slash 528, and I'm going to link to the Thomas Sowell book, Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, an International Perspective. Next week, I've got a bunch of interesting topics coming up. In fact, let me call up my Google Calendar. This is the only way I can keep the, the guests straight in my mind and who's coming up and what's going on. But Adam Kokesh is one. I am going to talk to Adam. I've had people saying we should have Adam on, and I've known Adam for a long time, and, you know, we have two different styles, let's put it that way, but he's an interesting guy, and his book, Freedom, is very well done, and I'm going to talk to him about that. So that's going to be fun. I'm going to talk to, let's see, who else are we going to talk to? Uh, Jeff Herbener and Joe Salerno are going to join me together to deal with a Think Progress article. Remember in the last Republican debate, Ted Cruz suggested that the dollar should be tied to gold. Well, of course, that's a heresy, and it's the job of Think Progress and Media Matters to hunt out heresy, right? So we have to get rid of any possible thought that's not in the three inches of allowable thought in the New York Times. So they have this ridiculous article critical of the gold standard, and we're going to take that on and smash it completely. Somebody asked me if I want to take it on. Yes, I do. And the three of us are going to do that next week. So Adam Kokesh, smashing critics of the gold standard. I'm going to have Mike Church on the show. Remember Mike Church from Sirius XM? He got canned by Sirius XM Satellite Radio. He's going to come on here and tell us the story about what happened to him. Brad Berzer has got a new biography of Russell Kirk, so we're going to talk about the history of conservatism, and we're going to make that fun, because I think that is a fascinating subject, and where do libertarians fit in on that? Uh, gosh, so many things. Matt Ridley coming back on the show, talk about government funding science. Uh, but you know what? I might not get to Matt Ridley tonight. I don't know how I'm going to do this because i got to fit in Lou Rockwell and talk about the how many Republican debates there are going to be. There's another Republican debate coming up. And i got to have Lou Rockwell to come on and talk about that on Thursday of next week. So that'll be episode 529, 530. So, so 532 
will be the, no no actually no I'm going to put that on that same day I'm going to do it on Wednesday that'll be episode five thirty one I don't know what to do but all I can say is it's an embarrassment of riches next week and I urge you to tune in and listen hope you guys are enjoying the show TomWoods.com slash five twenty eight is the page for today and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.